All right, hey guys, this is Michael Hegel here at Big Retro Video. Um, this is also in conjunction with the U University of Wisconsin Stout, where um, we welcome our digital cinema class tonight to be listening in on a conversation with Barry Anderson. He's a filmmaker and author, author of the uh, DSLR Filmmaker's Handbook, uh, now in its, I believe, second edition. You can find that on Amazon and such. Uh, probably Amazon's a good uh, choice today since uh, bookstores are a little hard to get into. And uh, we're going to be here talking to him about a couple of his features, as well as, uh, I guess, how we're we're dealing with 2020. So without further ado, let's pop on over and see Barry live. Barry live. Hello. How are you doing there? Good. How about you? Good. So you're coming to us from what part of the U.S. today? Uh, from Minneapolis. I'm in your, your, your hometown here, western suburbs. Yeah, so, down the street uh, a bit. Yeah, so are are most people listening or watching to us? Uh, I believe that this would be uh, watch. No, we're watchers. I'm, yeah, they're watching. I'm, I'm going to have to say that uh, if we do this again, I have to step up my game because your your background is far <laughs> superior to my background. So well, I I I got to I got to tip my hat to you. This is uh, th this is. A disease is what it is. Um, my buddy Lance, who was on the last show, started me collecting um, autograph stuff in like uh, in the '90s. He sent me, "Hey, Mike, I got this for you at a show." It was Richard uh, Joseph Turkle from um, Blade Runner and The Shining, yeah. um, and it's been uh, a, a straightforward run ever since of collecting memorabilia. So it's it's bad news, but uh, yeah, thanks and. Uh, you know, we're now in the obviously the era where everybody's got a background that they need to worry about or blur out, and I'm sorry yes. that we're. <laughs> no, but you know, good. you you probably got done with a lot of freaking art direction, uh, and you're just kind of tired of it right now after two <laughs> two pretty big features that were designed, were very design heavy shows. Yes, yes. Um, so I want to go. Can we? I, I, we have plenty of time, I think. Do you have time tonight? Yeah, I got, I got go time. Deep? Okay, great. So I want to go way back and find out how did, the heck did you get into this. Oh boy, that's a question. I th I feel like anybody who listens to you know directors and people in this industry, the common theme, I would say ninety seven percent of us, is usually from ages eight to twelve we had an epiphany, and then we've basically been on drugs ever since, and we never leave. Um, and that's that's my story. I, I I have no family in the industry. I have no contacts in the industry. At ten years old, when people are talking about I want to be a fireman, I want to be a police officer, I go. I want to be a director, and I said, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to go to the library and get a book on it. Uh, okay. And I actually went to the library, found the only book on directing that I could find, which was Frank Capra's autobiography. Not bad. And at this point, my parents used to pay me to try to read because I didn't like reading. So I get a book that back in the day had to go from library to library to library. So it took like three weeks for this book to get to me. And I, I kid you not, it was at least... You know, I, I just loaned it out to someone before all this happened, so I'm, I don't have it here with me. But, I mean, it's like 800 pages. It's like a, you know, yes. a Harry Potter tomb. And my mom, <laughs> God bless my mom, she was laughing at me, and she's like, yeah, there's no chance you're finishing that book. And not only did I finish the book, I, you know, bought a copy of the book. I, you know, quotes on my wall from the book, and I'm like, this is my manifesto. This is what I'm doing. This is how it works, and I'm, I'm going to do this. So, yeah, it's uh, it's been a while. That's a great choice. Um, I did a paper on uh, Capra in college and kind of bit down hard on his philosophy and things. So I agree completely. So was there a specific movie that kind of tipped you off? I mean, age-wise, maybe you and I are not neck and neck. I think you're younger than me. But what was your when were you eight to twelve? Because that is the disease-inducing uh, period for sure. For yeah. Boys, it, at least. Well, what's weird is my family didn't. My family didn't go to the movies. It, it was a, a luxury. That, that you know they didn't spend that on so i i was like in a weird spot because i was i was born after people were done playing with eight millimeter and 16 millimeter film yeah. but it was kind of right when digital video came around but it was like only rich people had them and they were like two decks you strapped around your shoulders so we didn't have one and it was like right at the dawn of vhs cassettes that you couldn't really get stuff yeah. or, you know so it was like i was kind of like born any other time in human history <laughs> when movies were born <laughs> Like made from then on, anywhere but where I was born was perfect, and I kind of had to struggle at every 
every phase, you know, everyone like people grow up now and they have nonlinear editors. I had that people like start with film cameras, like oh, I understand light and lighting. And I'm like, I didn't have that. I just had crappy video that I couldn't edit. And I would just show people and they're like, that's terrible. And right. Like, Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like my life was kind of like obstacle after obstacle, you know, and you just figure it out. That's what this whole business is about. But then you kind of became passionate about light in particular, I think. Yeah. The, well, I, so funny enough, um, not really what, what ended up happening is I did an end around. So a lot of people that give you advice when you go into this industry is like, have your backup plan, which is the worst advice you can ever give anybody. I tell people two things. If you want to be in this industry, is there anything else that you could see yourself doing? And if the answer is anything, then don't, don't go in this industry. But if you're like, no, I sadly, this is literally all I eat, breathe, drink, you know, think about consumed by then yes, you, you should go into this industry. Um, but my, I was a director and kind of how the, 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 I guess the transition happened. So, you know, growing up, I had the video camcorders. I went from the, the regular VHS to, you know, the VHS C to, you know, the high eight to the super high eight to the digital, you know, all that, you know, the whole progression there, that's what I dealt with. But what's weird is it's like everybody was coming off a film and then they basically all had to agree to jump in this medium that made everything look ugly. And I had a really hard time embracing them. Like, well, if I, my reel's ugly, then I can't get work. But what it ended up happening is as everything shifted, the job shifted. And what ended up happening is all the DPs started taking the director's work. So people would just be like, we're going to cut out a role, the DP, they can light it. They, you know, they can do all that sort of stuff. So, for years, my career started to kind of wane because it was hard. Unless you were like a high-end director, you had kind of an in being in the middle of the country. You, you didn't have those options. And so what I did is I remember, I remember distinctly, I, I would always fought. I'm like, I'm not a DP. I worked with some of the best, you know, my list of the DPs I've worked with are, you know, they're pretty legendary. And I, I was paying attention. And I remember once I got so mad because someone, I lost a job to a DP who called himself a director. And I was like, well, fine, if he's going to steal my work, I'm going to steal their work. So I decided I would tell someone I was a DP for once. And I went and I was so nervous. Uh, well, two, for two reasons. Number one, the, uh, the job that I was going to go do, they were kind of like, well, we just want you to come in. We know that you work with this camera. We trust your judgment and we will take care of everything else. It's not a big deal. It's a little thing for university. I'm like, okay, well, I get down there. And the first thing they tell me, it's a national commercial. So now I'm like, oh God, not only did I agree to be a DP and I thought it was kind of one that would just, you know, go on some website and no one would ever see. Well, now it's their, their linchpin for the entire institution. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. And we did the job. And it was funny because literally the first day on set, it reminded me kind of that age old question that very few times we run into people that hire you that know more than you. It almost never happens. So instantly I can impress them just by one of the first things they did is they, they had these new LED lights at the time, the one by one light yeah. panels. And they, I'm telling you, it was like Santa Claus had come to their office. They thought it was so cool. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, that's great, but there's not a lot of output. But the thing that put them over the top that like won the trust of my client is I unbuttoned the two top pieces where the top fell down and the gels went and they're like, Oh my God, there's gels you can put on it. And from that moment on, I was basically like the Maharaji and I was, you know, anything I said was gospel. And I was like, well, that's all it takes to impress my clients. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. So you kind of found, do you, do you think you found a niche in being on top of maybe some technical things? Because I think. Yeah. That... Well, I, well, going back to Frank Capra, uh, in, in his autobiography, what I loved is he actually went to MIT and he was very tied in to tech. And I think a lot of people get worried. I know when DSLRs came out, I jumped on that bandwagon early because I saw the end result and I knew it wasn't a perfect tool, but I knew kind of what could be done with it. And it felt to me like, oh, we're going back to actually filmmaking where you have to understand lenses and you have to understand lighting. And it was that never shy away from any sort of technological advancement. And the more knowledge that you have, the more invaluable, invaluable you are on every set. So I embraced that so that I could get work and then over the last, whatever, 10, 15 years, I've now been ebbing more and more back to directing. But now I understand and have a much closer relationship with camera operators, DPs. So it's one of those things. I went and took a Steadicam course, like a week long, you know, several thousand dollars, all the big rigs. And I knew I was never going to be a Steadicam op, but I wanted to understand if I hired a Steadicam, how do I talk to them? How do I actually set up the shots with that? Because you can 
talk all you want in your house going, oh, I'll do this and do that, but you don't know what the limitations are. And I, I know a lot of my study camp friends, they'll be like, yeah, someone usually rents us and they think because they spent the money that every shot should be a study cam. And then you basically just make them angry and your shots don't look good. And, you know, it's again, that knowledge. So I think knowledge is key. Having some understanding of tech is definitely an important part of the process. How did you, uh, how did you end up at ground zero of DSLR? Cause you sort of did. Yeah, no, I was, I was, uh, I, you know, I remember, uh, the big thing that happened is I had a couple friends send me a video. It was like, you know, the first couple days when Vincent Lafrey's, uh, kind of whatever, uh, uh, drawing a blank on the name of it now, uh, Reverie launched and everybody was like, isn't this cool? And as soon as I saw it, it was the first time I saw a video camera capture something similar to the film stock that I used to use. And I said, I know nothing about this. I don't know what's going on, but this, this is such a big thing that I'm like, I ordered it, put on my credit card. And now mind you, <laughs> this was in 08 when the whole world was falling apart and we were all going to be out on the street with you know, being bankrupt. So I doubled down on like, I need to know what this is because I think this is, this is going to change a lot. And it did, it revolutionized a ton. So it was that immediate instinct of knowing that what you were seeing was, you know, if you, I, I'm sure you're this way because I, I, I know you well enough that you, the, the greatest time in cinephiles history is when DVDs came out and they, for some reason spent, millions of dollars in these awesome behind the scenes things that yeah. justified and you watch those and almost to every stance it's like whether it's jurassic park whether it's the abyss all these major leaps forward someone was sitting in a room and when we look at it back at it now they they have video of like these dinosaurs running you know on this old and you're like how did that turn into jurassic park but it's just something it doesn't have to be in that moment it doesn't have to be perfect you just have to realize like Oh, this is a major leap forward, and everything from here on is going to change. And I saw that right away with DSLR, and uh, that was a that was that w that did well for my career. That was that was a good time, <laughs> for sure. What, uh, what was the first thing you did uh, when you got the camera? Uh, I well, I what I found out by the time me placing my order recklessly and getting it that at the time you could not actually control your. Uh, you couldn't lock your uh, your aperture, so it was kind of like a wild west of trying to like have your camera think for you. So you were doing things to try to trick. But again, you know, nobody was sure if they were going to have updates for the camera if it was going to work. But I'm like, I don't care if this camera doesn't work. I have to understand and learn and start kind of you know, in, I guess educating myself on the landscape because I knew there's going to be more companies popping up. People would be confused by it. So I just basically did a whole lot of playing. You know, I sat there and took pictures. I tested different lenses. I was trying different video things. And I remember when we got, I remember where I was. I was in San Diego in a ballroom. And we finally got the, the update and I got the aperture lock. And I went in with a, a friend of mine to a big ballroom. All the lights were out and we went over to the <laughs> exit sign. There was a green exit sign. And I ran a video clip. And you could see him like he was lit by like by a light. legitimate light. Yeah. I'm like, there is spaces. <laughs> and I said, this literally changes everything. And then from there, it was like, it took off like a rocket ship. Yeah, just, uh, I've completely forgot that the Mark I was uh, auto exposure for that first, auto exposure, what, year maybe. or yep. something? Uh, it, was, yeah, it was almost a year. Yeah, I got mine in yeah. 08 and it was in, I think it was mid 09 before they had the ability to lock it. So you had to do a whole bunch of weird things to kind of make it work, but it was definitely not ideal and definitely would not have tried making a feature film on it in, in, in that particular iteration yeah, until yeah, iteration, they had. Right. It. But the idea of those impossible ISOs was like you say, it was a game changer. I mean, it was weird. I remember the first time it was right out of high school. I did a short film and I used all of my savings to, I hired a legitimate film crew, 35 millimeter. My DP oh, wow. was from like LA that was like, had worked with Brian De Palma. And I remember this is my mom and I have had moments where she supports my career and moments where she thinks I'm insane. And this is one of those ones that I have to give my mom a lot of credit for because she did not know what she was getting into. She worked at a clinic at the time. And so on the weekend, we were just going to shoot. And when those trucks rolled in, <laughs> they started blowing <laughs> off those lights. Instantly, she's like, I'm going to get fired. I will lose my job over this. And it was like it was like you unleashed some sort of energy and these people were running around and cables were going. And suddenly what my little video camcorder or little quartz light <laughs> I had. And I'm like, OK, I don't understand anything. And it was it was that was like my that was my college is I was just asking questions. I was 
understanding why things were happening and all of those things that were so difficult and so big and so unwieldy and so expensive suddenly i'm like man i i could just take my office desk lamp and if i do this this and that like they would in a big one i have everything i need on my desk and so it just made filmmaking economical but you could not, you could make it not look terrible which was usually what you had to do you had to make everything look really bad for a really long time so it was just as much about the placement of a piece as opposed to the tool itself i mean it really was both i mean you couldn't have done it without but it was it would it just made it where now you could have a small crew and you could pull off a shot that you couldn't pull off before you know without you know i mean i remember when we went in first it felt like if you remember die hard when they go in and they're going to go cut all the lines and take over the building that's what it used to be like they used to rip off the whole front oh, yeah. of the box and they would like tap in and people would be like in, back off man. we might we might actually electrocute ourselves and die right now and you're like i don't know i don't pay you enough to you know potentially kill yourself and then all that was just <laughs> magically gone and you could just you know create and it was really really exciting yeah an led panel became a 5k in comparison yeah but that was before led panels came out totally. that like preceded yeah. them because i did i did the uh, uh film in italy at the end of 2009 beginning very beginning of 2010 and like I had a four inch LED light and that was like I was on the cutting edge, cutting edge. But that wasn't right. enough to like, you know, you can't light a street with that. <laughs> the so, physics still work. That Italian film. Um, yeah. What did you learn on that? I learned a whole lot of things that you shouldn't yeah. do is usually what happens when you when you make, you know, early films. They're basically nothing but mistakes. And I made so many mistakes in making that movie. But what I also figured out is that you'll hear people talk about when you're young and you're dumb and you kind of don't know any better. Uh, the stuff that we pulled off and got, I think if I went back to try to make it now, I mean, I remember <laughs> sounds absolutely stupid. So anybody who's, who was thinking they should listen to my advice when I tell the story, they'll immediately go, no, I'm not listening to this idiot anymore. So we, I went early to pick out a couple kind of exteriors that we're going to shoot We'd been and did some location scouting. We knew we were going to shoot in this one hotel, but I knew that we needed a bigger room. So I needed to kind of figure out how to cheat it. So I literally went two days before the crew showed up and I walked around Venice and just walked into as many hotels until I found one that would work. And I like convinced him and it like totally the scenes work. And I'm like this. I mean, how close to, you know, everyone being on the ground and time and money is burning and just thinking that like, Oh, of course I can figure that out in Venice. Of course I can just go around and that will work out in my favor. Uh, that's not the way you should do it. But sometimes when you start out, if you overthink it, you never you never do it. So there, you there's can't break there's definitely that wall. yeah yeah there's definitely a happy medium of the two. Yeah, I'm uh, I try to in, invoke naivete <laughs> uh, still <laughs> in my like uh, trying to do things I don't know how to do is a big uh, big place for um, for that and. Um, uh, maintaining that independent spirit. Did you, did you speak Italian? Did that? Uh... No, I don't speak any foreign language. Uh -huh. And when I try, it immediately shows them that I know nothing, and so they feel sad for me. And then they help me out. <laughs> that was the trick. It just had to seem just, really sad. You, you have to, you, no, it's, it's more pathetic than it is sad. It's like you know, yeah. it's my friends that you know when I try to speak Spanish or something, when I say it, they're like, "Do you realize that you said it like this?" I'm like. No, but I tried, and so then we move on. So I, I've stopped That's trying to speak foreign languages because I'm so bad at them, and I, I try to use more of my personality and wild gestures with my hands and arms and pointing a lot, and usually that gets me where I need to go. <laughs> Well, that's how so many of those Italian, Italian co-productions got made, right? Correct, correct. Clint just said, well, you just, uh, just gesture where you need me. Uh, what was the name of the, that film, the Italian one? Uh, it was called uh, uh, The Shamus. It was a Shamus kind of a film noir, comedic film noir movie. Yeah. Um, that was um, that was really ballsy to do. Um, what was the crew? Was it you and maybe a couple oh, of we, people? I mean, it was, it was me, a producer. We had one guy for audio. We had one PA. Um, I had a kind of a, I was directing slash DP on one camera, and then I had a DP on the second camera. And then it was just the cast. And the cast was four or five people or something? Four or five people, yes. I mean, yeah. it was definitely less than 10, and depending on when they were in or out, you know, we had probably between six to, eight, six to 10 people tops. And so we spent about a little... two and a half weeks. <laughs> That and, was, I guarantee, that's great. and I guarantee you with a regular film camera and crew, we would have gotten shut down everywhere we went. And in this case, nobody asked us. Nobody cared. 
We could do whatever we wanted. And I wonder how many years it took before people realized that the DSLR was what it was and what it was capable of and whether they stopped You have a much, people. much, much higher view of humanity than I do. I do not think they have a clue that it still exists. Hey, yeah, good. Yeah, and great. <laughs> I think... Uh, I, I just take pictures. It. Yeah, you always... It's always... Because it's a still camera. You just click, 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 click. They don't have to know the technical workings of it. Did you ever put down sticks in Venice yeah. proper to... Yeah, so nobody... It was fine, nobody cared. right? Yeah, nobody sure. cared. Italy. I mean, usually what you do is you go out and buy lunch, and they just go shoot in front of the store, and they're fine because you bought yeah. lunch. So. <laughs> Good. Good. Funny. And you get some food out of it. Yeah. There's a big leap between this and the two new features. What happened in between? The um, Well, basically, I parlayed the buying my first DLR, DSLR, shot that movie, and then basically I started – that's when I started transitioning out of directing into DP. So I did a lot more kind of corporate, sports, that sort of stuff. And then I was able to come back. I started shooting my next feature. That was in 2010. So there's probably about three and a half years in between. Then I shot a movie called uh, Relentless, one actress in a house that we flooded with 40,000 gallons of water. Um, so that was another stupidly brilliant idea. And then, <laughs> then I got hired on someone to direct uh, another feature, a little horror movie. And then right after that, I got picked up to do The Lumber Baron. And then uh, from then we went from the Lumber Baron to uh, Soviet Sleep Experiment. And uh, now I'm directing a pilot for a series uh, supposed to start at the end of May. We'll see if that still still stays. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so now it's kind of, you know, it's now a mix of corporate, you know, uh, you know, corporate and uh, sports and other stuff mixed in with the narrative. But uh, the narrative has at least you know, set itself up at the table and I'm able to do it more frequently as opposed to once every, you know, five years. That's awesome. Well, I want to talk about how we got the Lumber Baron, uh, but let's run, let's run the trailer for folks who haven't seen it and okay. come back, uh, figure out how that uh, project ended up uh, in your lap. Okay. The responsibility of the lumber business is a great way. Daddy! Oh, Mr. Rimsdale. Your company is floundering, and you are certainly in no position to salvage it. In fact, put a question mark by all of the accounts that I found no evidence of payment. Are you telling me that we delivered lumber to customers, but we never received payment for it? I wouldn't trust a Lynch farther than I could toss him. Byron Lynch? Oh, yes, he's taken quite a shine to me. As far as the house goes, I don't care. I like Adeline. You need to care. If you wed Mary Catherine, our family's future will be secured. I will be going to the lumber camp under an alias. I need to see what's really going on. Uh, looky here, boys. We got ourselves a new jack. This family is nowhere without this business. You're gonna meet with Byron Lynch, aren't you? He's kind and caring and he likes me. Are you sure he likes you? And not just your dowry? He was there. What do you mean, he was there? Jonas Whitman. Been snooping around. Leaking our information. What do you got in mind? An accident. What do you say, fellas? Should we give uh, Jonas Whitman here a proper welcome? Hey, boys, careful now. Get out of the way! Ah! This family is in trouble. Cool. So big, big looking period movie. Um, how did this come to you? So I'll give you a little bit of backstory and then explain exactly how it happened. So a lot of times people, when they come to me and ask for advice or how did you get somewhere or how did it lead to that? And I tell people two things. Number one, if you're not doing something, then nothing can come. So it's better to do something really poorly and have it be a total mess than doing nothing at all. Because even when things don't go well, you end up making connections, you end up doing stuff. So the I made the, I think, a smart move. But when everybody was panicking in 08, I buy a new camera. I use the last of my savings to take a ragtag group of people over to Italy, make this film, come back. The world's like, hey, there's no money, there's no work. And then that helped me, by doing that, that helped me get, land my book deal. Because when I talk to the book deal, I'm like, 
you know, there's a lot of people who are using stuff. I'm like, well, hey, I went and shot a whole feature so we can use all this footage. And they're like, wow. So I was able to basically make more money off the book than we spent on the movie. But then the book helped me land some of my corporate gigs that started to help me get the gear and kind of the other stuff that I needed. So then by working on editing the movie that wasn't great that we shot in Italy, started teaching me more about the visual language, what I didn't 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 know, which was much cheaper than going to college. And then I decided to make that um, uh, Relentless, which is kind of the, the one actress in the house. And again, it was a crazy idea. And I learned, I got to tell you this story because it's, it's one of my favorites. So growing up, you asked when, when I got this bug, you know, when I was 10, do you know how hard it is to get people to play with you when you want to make movies when you're 10 years old? Talk about non-popular. So I, 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 util and I still utilize this trick to this day. I just tell people I'm using the trick on them and they still go for it. So it's kind of nice. But what I did as a child is fireworks were legal in Minnesota. So I had cousins that came from Wisconsin. And so they'd bring just a little like blackjacks, like nothing. They don't shoot off. They're just mostly harmless. But boy, oh boy, do they look like squibs. So I would give them some money. I said, just bring me a, a couple packs of black cats. So I would tell my friends, I'd be like, hey, do you want to come for the weekend and we can make a movie with like little Star Wars figures in my backyard that would take hours and they would hate. But I said, at the end of the day, you can help be my pyrotechnic person and blow <laughs> them up. And they would work for like 10 hours a day <laughs> just to be able to light off two or three fireworks. And then they would ask me, can I come back tomorrow and do it again? So I learned early, I, if, you, if you don't have a passionate friend, there are ways to manipulate people. Yeah. So when I did Relentless, you know, I didn't have any money. I was like, I just need to do this. I need to figure out a way to bring this thing into, into being. And so I said, I, you know, someone told me a story about someone's basement flooding. And I go, hmm. I remember going up to cabins up north and sometimes they build new farmhouses and they take them down. I'm like, I wonder if I could find a house that's being moved and flood a basement. And lo and behold, I could. So I had this great expensive thing that was not very expensive because it was all being destroyed anyway. So to get my crew, I just told people, hey, I'm going to lock people in the basement and flood it. And of course, all young men are like, oh, yeah, let's go do that. <laughs> that me. sounds amazing. Yeah, that's me. That's and true. then two days into filming, they're like, God almighty, I will never do this again because this is awful work. I can't <laughs> feel my feet. <laughs> Mosquitoes yeah. are everywhere. Um, so, again, it was that sort of way. And then a lot of those people that worked kind of for free or cheap and went through that, I've now kept on all of my paying jobs for years and have made them untold tens of thousands of dollars. So it's, I also try to be, you know, if people take a bet on something I'm doing, I try my best to make sure that you can kind of yeah. give that back. But the reason I tell you that is the one of the key parts to some of this corporate work I had and the trailer for Relentless is what I sent to the producer of The Lumber Baron. And uh, so funny story is they I was on the short list. It was basically one and one A for who they wanted to direct it. And I had technically had responded to them after the one. So I became one A. So I did not get the job. And so, but I do what I tell people to do is like, even when things don't go your way, you don't get a job or whatever, just make sure that, you know, you're very gracious and you follow totally. up with people. Yeah. And I just remember, I said, that's great. I said, I'm super happy that you found someone you're comfortable with. That's fantastic. You know, if you end up needing anything, let me know. And then I think a few months later, I just, you know, because I was curious about the project, I was interested. And I just said, you know, you know, just curious how everything's going, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're like, funny story. <laughs> <laughs> We've parted ways with our director and we want to have you come in. And so, um, you know, they had Which already they might not have stuff. done if you hadn't they, contacted them. I mean, they would have had a whole new A. <laughs> you, you can, correct. Correct. Well, the, the thing is, is you, you know, I don't know. How would I say this? The. They could have had me as number two, or it could have just been a list of people. And they're like, oh, yeah, I liked his stuff. But because he's there, I, you know, what really goes on in someone's psyche? We tell stories, you know, to make ourselves feel good. I was definitely <laughs> the number two choice, and yes. I won. Um, but the so, but what was interesting is when, when I came on board, the, by the way, uh, Karen, the producer, is one of my favorite people. Um, uh, I absolutely adored working with her, um, and we'll, we will definitely work together again. But she had just sold off. Uh, they had a, a theater troupe for like 25 years. So this was kind of they wanted to take the stories they were telling and put it, you know, they wanted to put it on film so you could, you know, obviously monetize it, but more people could see it. But it was like 
they were, you know, when they when I first got the pitch, they were planning on shooting it all on a GH4. They had the microphones from the theater that are taped to your forehead. I mean, it was like a whole different kind of production. And I'm like, yeah. okay. And so then, you know, I got to work with them and kind of show them some things that I had. And I'm like, let's do it this way. And, you know, they they kind of rose to their end and found more money or for, more resources. And we were able to put together something that was, I think, beyond the scope that they thought they could do. But then I utilized, you know, they only had, it was really nice. They had like 70 speaking roles in this like feature, which is insane for a low budget feature. Um, but they were trying to pay everyone. So it was like came out to like 25 or 50 bucks a day. So it was like glorified. You're basically working for free. So I said, what we need to do is pick a few, few major characters. We got to throw some money at to get good actors. And then we'll just kind of have to do our best to kind of fill in with people who want a shot and want something good on the reel. And I think we did a, a fairly nice balance of that. Um, but again, it was just, kind of talking through what our resources are, what can we do? And Karen and her team, Ruth, they're so tied in, in that community. They were like getting us these like locations and they're like, yeah, we have, we have total access to this. And I'm like, how much that cost? Well, you know, I helped, I helped his husband when he was sick. So they're just giving us for free. And they're like, you know, we need to have this, you know, person, they'll come in with their whole equipment and do this for us. And I was like, man, alive, how, you know, talk about a lot of times when you're in the, you in know, in pre-production or writing, you're like, you come up with an idea and then you immediately shut it down like it's not possible because i mean in the first script that i had um for those that have not you know it's a movie about you know lumberjacks back in the early 1900s but the the scene was he goes out to lumberjack for the day and then you basically wipe and he comes right back looking like he got beat to high heck because it's hard work and i said N we we have to have at least one scene where a main tree has is to fall to like well like i mean you can't you can't not but it was that whole thing of like, how can we possibly afford and do a scale of trees falling? But once we started brainstorming, suddenly then there was ideas that was safe and relatively inexpensive. And I mean, we basically worked with geniuses because they would come out and they would be like, we're going to land the tree and they'd make a mark. And I mean, it was like, it, w it wasn't even an inch off. I mean, it just, they set it down. And you're like, how in the heck do you do this? It was like mystical magic. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was quite an ordeal and uh, really proud with how it turned out. Where was that shot? That was shot in around Eau Claire and Chippewa Falls in kind of central Wisconsin. Which is sort of the center of the uh, lumber uh, industry at that time, too, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it's funny because people, people now, I think, especially in the Midwest for some reason, we don't realize how big uh, the, the lumber was in this region because it all got clear cut and then they moved west. But, you know, when people think of like, oh, yeah, you know, the Pacific Northwest, that's logging. Well, that was here. And what people don't really realize when you do the research is that the lumber barons, that was like Bill Gates of his time. Like those were the richest people in the world. And we don't think like that. We're not like, well, I didn't realize that that's where all the wealth was. But then you're like, every single thing in the world was built with wood. It's like, that is the currency of the world, <laughs> wood. So, I mean, you're going to make a lot of money if you're controlling wood. So it was interesting. For sure. So, um, so a lot of the locations came through community um, people that knew people, and that's great. Um, hundreds of people in the movie. Some yes. lots of lots of speaking parts. Did were you involved at all with the casting of the upper yes. crust of that? Yeah. Yep. When I again when I came on, I was I was a little bit late to the party, um, and they were luckily they had not cast anybody yet. They had gone through some rounds of narrowing so i got to see all of the stuff that they had filmed and kind of figure out who might work and might not we had some callbacks and then we just kind of blended because originally they were going to only do people from chippewa falls and eau claire and for those that aren't familiar those aren't the biggest cities in america so finding 70 quality actors in that small of a town is kind of a, a tall order so we were able to find some people from chicago from wisconsin from minneapolis uh i think for some from iowa Got one or two, I think one from Texas, one from uh, uh, L.A. But again, they were all really cheap and they were all really excited and they all really kind of bit into their roles. We just I think we found the right people that had the right attitude and uh, it, it, it should have been more expensive than it was. And we got it done for less than that. It looks like it was shot in a couple of different seasons. How long did it take to make it? <laughs> <laughs> so the the main the first stretch we did in the summer. So a lot of those scenes inside of the old buildings I can't stress to you how hot it was. There was one scene uh, 
I think we had to reshoot part of the scene, so I'm not sure if the one that I'm talking about is in the final movie or not. But it's when uh, our main character went to go meet the 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 stable boy, and they have these. They're not Clydesdales, but they're about as close to a Clydesdale as you can get. These horses were absolute dinosaurs, and there was two of them, and it was a small <laughs> thing, and it's like 95 degrees, and we had for sound, we had to shut all the doors, and so we basically cleared everyone out. We had our two actors. We had our one sound guy and my DP camera op were in there and he was up on a ladder and not to be not to be on the more uh, gross side of things. But when those horses pee, it's a lot of pee. So it smelled and it like burned your eyes and you would sweat. (laughs) And we basically had X amount of time before our camera operator would pass out when they shut the door. So we'd be like, go. And someone would be timing it. And we're like, "Okay, is he going to pass out yet? And so. It was a little bit. It was a little bit strange Scary. because it was. It's taking place in the winter, like so. We're shooting the interiors oh, and we're dying, worse. and then we yeah. go back to shoot the exteriors, and it was like we had to shut down production because it was as cold as it's ever been in. Uh, right. uh, so I mean, like literally, like all of Wisconsin shut down. All the schools stay home, and what the independent film crew is like, we're gonna go out and shoot today. <laughs> <laughs> it looks beautiful. <laughs> yeah, well, that that was the, all of the beautiful snowy stuff that. I, I take credit and I also take the blame. Um, I'm glad it was the very last day of filming because everybody hated me that I made them yeah. go out because it was wet and it was nasty and it was awful. And it was like, you know, me and the DP were like, this is like a million dollar production day. We must go out. And everyone's like, nope, we don't need it for the movie. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be in the movie. <laughs> it's going to be the trailer. It's going to be everywhere because it was beautiful. Yeah. But yeah, I I can, pull out they the, were done uh, at that point. I pull out the John Milius quote at that point and say, uh, the pain is temporary, but the film is forever. <laughs> that is so. true. But most that's really only people like the director, the DP, the producer. Most of your day laborers, they're, they're, that, that quote does not work on them. <laughs> My pain does not translate to that one second of screen time. So um, how do you do – what's the secret to uh, that romantic period look? You must have found a few things. Um, so we had we had an amazing, amazing costume designer who actually made a lot of the clothes. She was on for a couple months, and her and another seamstress, they made, I think it I, I'm going off memory, but I think it was like 70 or 80% of all costumes they actually physically sewed. Um, and she's a tremendous talent, Lindsay. Um, and then we had a fantastic art director uh, and her team. They basically were going, you know, what's funny is these different museums that we used as our locations. What's weird is it's almost like its own network. So you have people who own these or own houses similar to them, and they all buy, sell, and trade like era accurate pieces. So if you needed something, you could tap into these people and they'd be like, oh, yeah, no, that lamp, that's that's like 10 years too late. You can't have that in there. And so they're like, I got, I got one in my basement. I'll get one. You can swap it out. <laughs> So there, there was a little bit of the communal, a little bit of the team, um, but it was, I mean, it was great because we were, we, we did not have a big crew and it was a lot to get done in a short period of time. And had they not, had the producer not had the foresight to have those people on, the authenticity would not have been there. Uh, what, what did you use to light it? Uh, <laughs> we used uh, an Eco Punch and then partway through we switched to a uh, Silk 220 as kind of our big light. Um, any of the lights coming through the windows, those were jo- uh, Joker 800s. And then we had two little silk, uh, 110 and 210. And that was the, that was our, <laughs> our army of lights. It was not, not much. Yeah, and then a lot of practicals. Very natural look. Yeah. looks cool. Um, was it released? It was. So we actually, we got it released in theaters. Um, and if, for those who are kind of crazy about the business side of the industry, Most films that get released don't get a theatrical release. And I think they said on average now, I think the average movie that gets released in theaters on the limited release make, I think it's like $10,000. I think they wanted to average at 30,000 before they yank it. And we, we, we ran for over six weeks in our couple cities and we grossed just shy of $90,000. So it was supposed to be a, it was supposed to be, you're going to lose a lot of money, but we're going to raise value elsewhere. And they're kind of like, hey, we kind of broke even. And this, you know, I think the other film that was released by the distributor that made my, like, ours was like the second highest grossing for the year. 
Um, so we we were definitely I think we were three times the average, and we were we were kind of a rarity. So we had that. We there's no you know there's no kind of known stars uh, in the movie, um, and we were able to get secure. We did a air, how do you call it? Airline deal. Uh, you know you can watch them on yeah. the movies, and apparently they don't do that with non movie star, non studio. So uh-huh. we were able to get it because the subject matter uh, was right yeah. for kind of families and the thing. So we we were able to secure that. So it's it's going through its motions. I don't know how much money, you know, it's coming in and stuff, but we're we're seemingly getting positive results all the way along the way and kind of the little engine that can that oh this doesn't normally happen for people but for you it seemed to work so i know that you're friends with uh charles hubble and charles. it was funny because when i he was in the movie um but i brought it to him and we were talking about it and he he just looked at me because i mean it all sounded crazy you're like okay yeah. this is a weird story set in iowa like you know or in uh wisconsin and he looked at me he's like are you gonna do this bird i'm like I'm in it, Charles. I would like you to be in it, but it was kind of like that. Is this? Is are you sure this is? You only get so many swings in this business. Yeah, said, yeah. And then it's taken off, and afterwards, and he looks at me, he's like, "Is this the movie that's going to make us a success?" I'm like, "It might be. It might be. We don't know. We'll see." Yeah, on paper, it, it, you would be it'd be a head scratcher, but it's just unique enough, and it doesn't matter who's in it, perhaps Correct. for that yep. reason, and it looks sharp. Um, what were the two cities that it was in? Uh, it was actually in three. It was in L.A., sure. which I actually flew out to go see my own premiere in L.A. Um, and then it played in, um, uh, I'm trying to think. I don't, uh, it was either Chippewa Falls or uh, right. Eau Claire. I can't remember. And then we were in Ontario, Canada. Cool. But I did not fly to Ontario, Canada to uh, to find out what it was like. So how long if anybody out there in... watched it. How long did it run in L.A. then? Um, I don't know. I don't have the exact dates. It was like somewhere between one to three weeks i think it was like one oh, or two great. weeks no it's um great. but yeah it was uh it was it was pretty incredible the one in the one in eau claire i mean we were i think we were out grossing the avengers on a per screen average uh in in that city it was just like it was okay. kind of like you know you're you're splitting hairs we were on like one screen as opposed to like 900 screens yeah, but when, you, when you see these like reports yeah like, like as number. an independent filmmaker you're like ha take that marvel <laughs> i'm putting <laughs> that on a damn poster <laughs> um were there lessons learned from this one? Oh, there. I mean, there's always lessons. If you're not, oh, yeah. if you if you're not, if you're not learning stuff, then you're 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 in trouble. Um, the, I guess, on what front? I feel like I could go a lot of different ways. Uh, today. Is there, I don't know. Let's, what, go, who's... let's go with the acting front, since this is a big acting show. Um, boy, this is a. It's a deep. Well. You're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> Uh, all right, so we'll put, let me quick put on the uh, safety filter here. I think it's in the software here somewhere. There we go. So, well, here, here's here's what I have to say: is uh, every producer I work with now, it's a cliche on you must, 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 must get the best possible actors you can in the roles. So when I hear people that are like, "Well, that doesn't that person doesn't look the way I want them to," I don't care. Like I will take a person that can act over someone who looks good that isn't as good of an actor. Or actress, the I think the big thing is is so much of what drives the business side of this is in having some sort of name. So when people, especially some people who start smaller and you know they have these big dreams, there's a reason that everything gets packaged around a star. So it's whatever budget level you're at, make sure that you're swinging for whatever fence of a star or a name or someone that was in a show with a name, you know, there's always a way to get someone to add something to that, that, uh, the back of the, the VHS tape, uh, for us old folk. Um, but then the rest of it's just, you know, just find the best possible people. And, you know, I guess there's questions I was earlier, I was going through, we're casting for this, uh, um, uh, series. And, you know, as a director, I keep learning new ways of a live, you know, reading all this sort of stuff. And then I, I don't know how, what percentage. Like, I think it's like seven out of 10, nine out of 10 times. You just never hear anything. Like it's just, whoop, we wasted your time. We're yeah. not getting back to you. And being on both sides of the coin in terms of, there are times where I legitimately don't have time to get back to everybody. And I feel bad, but it's also like, do I take time to respond to everybody and then wreck the rest of it? So it's, it, I have some sympathy that it's not always done out of, you know, miss. So yeah. now what I do, if I'm working with actors, not to be a pompous, arrogant, you know, director, but if I'm doing something and we kind of run through what I need, I will sometimes be like, Hey, 
you know, you could take or leave this, but I'll give them kind of a note if we were working harder or some tendency that they have that they can be aware of that either they can either use to their benefit or something that, hey, chances are other people looking at this too just want you to be aware of it. So I'm at least trying to give them some value beyond, you know, so if they don't get the, the role, there's some sort of oh, wow. takeaway. Takeaway, um, totally. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, do you think that having a such a big cast where, say, 70, 80% of it was little local community stuff, did, was that a challenge in terms of giving it the big feel that you wanted? I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the kind of the bit actors we had really did a good job with what they were given. I think the hardest part with that is is when you when you're strapped for time and you since we were dealing everything was on location, you know everything back in that era is tiny. So we're in like these palatial mansions that feel like their living room couldn't fit a squirrel. And so you're like, well, how am I supposed to have a whole family get together in here and film it? And by the way, we also found rich people of the past. They're all sadistic because they put mirrors on every wall in every room. <laughs> so like filming anything and trying to boom for anything is an absolute nightmare. Um, so I remember on their first walkthrough as the director, I was like, hey, we, I, you know, because we we're trying to ask what we can and can't do to the, you know, the, the actual physical space that's a, you know, living museum. And I asked if we could put dulling spray on the windows and like the producer and everyone's like, oh, we're not doing that. Like, you know, we're not even going to ask. And I'm like, okay. And then during filming, everyone's like, why didn't we dull those? I'm like, well, because I was told we couldn't because <laughs> yeah. that would have helped a lot. Um, when you, you took over, it was kind of uh, you said it was a theater mics and GH Panasonic shooter show. Yeah. Did the budget go bigger when you arrived because of the vision? No. That that, well, the budget did go bigger, but it was not because of that. I Luckily, when I came on, the way that I worked with the producer, tried to see what they had for the budget, tried to work it around, I brought a lot of my equipment so that, again, if you've ever worked on a feature, it is like, it's like a child that you're giving birth to. And so if you're going to go through the effort, like at some point, you're like, hey, if I make enough money, I'll throw in some stuff to make sure it's as good as we can possibly be. So when I cut deals with people, I'd be like, hey, we can get you this much, which is more than they have. But then can you throw in those two pieces of equipment or can you do this or, or whatever the case was? And so we, we were able to get more bang for a buck without increasing the budget. What did increase the budget is the fact that somehow there was a miscue. We had a, 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 a budget for the actors and a budget for a crew. And the budget for the crew was for like, I can't remember, it was like 20 some days, 30 days, something like that. But we only had budget for the actors for 18 days. So suddenly we like lost like a week and a half or more of production that we were trying to cram this already long feature film into this short time. And they were long, brutal days. And it was the sort of thing where we were getting material, but like we weren't getting transitions. We weren't, there was no elegance. It was just like meat and potatoes that was going to kind of hack together weird. And uh -huh. um, I, I went to the, went to the producer. I said, so here's the option. We can keep working 18 hour days and we're going to, you know, get to this and this is what's going to be. Or if you have any other resources, we need to set up another, you know, whatever week, 10 days of shooting. We need to like get through part of the edit, figure out what we're missing, make sure that if we have to change a scene or do something and kind of make sure the whole thing blends. And uh, they went out and got that and got us the extra shooting days. And it, I mean, I wish I would have a pre-edit to our pickups <laughs> and then a post because it's a whole different movie. Uh, and people think it's because you're ill-planned. And if you look at every major motion picture, there's always, always a budget line for reshoots and pickups Bring after back, you've yep. actually looked at it. Because if you don't, you're always making choices in the edit room that change everything. And then you're like, oh, you know, I used to yell at my dad because he's obsessed with finding mistakes in movies. He's like, look, that water glass or that thing got set down there. And I used to, you know, and I used to think about that. I'm like, why do they screw up so often? Well, now that I work, I'm like, we'll just decide <laughs> there's a whole scene that happens that's not needed and we'll cut it out. And the continuity worked for that. But once we throw it out, continuity is out the window. Yeah. But if you catch them in the story, you don't care about those. But you'll always make the story choice over the continuity when it comes to making sure that, you know, people want to actually watch the movie. Amen. So you talked about getting uh, more of a name actor. Um, I think that leads us to our Soviet sleep discussion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let's take a moment to take a look at the trailer for that yep. so that people can get up to speed on it and then uh, ask you some of the same sorts of uh, troubling questions. <laughs> 
Just and action. Making a movie's easy. Making a good movie is like going to war. And making a great movie is nearly impossible. But for Twin Cities native Barry Anderson, it's impossible! You may have seen some of his work on TV or the big screen, including his Twin Cities Film Fest audience award winning The Lumber Baron. Today he's making the Soviet sleep experiment. My role is subject five. Stop looking at me, don't look at me, stop looking at me. That's nasty. These are prisoners that have been stripped of their identities and been promised to be released if they go through this experiment. In the film, subjects were forced to spend an extremely long period of time in this chamber. Shut up! Trying to sleep in here. Apparently, back in the 1940s, the Red Army, they did a sleep experiment where they tried to keep people awake for 30 days. It's creepy, scary. And although the film is quietly being shot on a small set in Lakeville, the talent is big. Our lead actress, Ava, she's originally from Argentina. She's phenomenal, by the way. Our lead actor, who is actually from Poland, before this film, he just finished Quentin Tarantino's new movie. He's actually playing Roman Polanski. And then we have one of my favorite comedians, Chris Kattan. Yes, that Chris Kattan. <laughs> Fresh out of the makeup chair, the comedian said he jumped at the opportunity to try something new. I've done drama in a, a couple times, but I haven't done one like this dramatic. I read the script, sounded appealing. But the price of having world famous talent is they're in high demand. He's like, hey, by the way, they're flying me out to do the Tonight Show. I wish it was Christmas today. It was like a rush of like. <laughs> Being on Fallon on live television and then back in here. We lost a day of production with him, but it was fun because we basically just had stunt doubles. That'll be the, the fun fact on IMDb is can you find the scenes where Chris Kattan's in it, but it's not really him. So uh, seeing that piece reminded me that uh, Paul Cram, also a Minnesota actor, is in that one. Charles yeah, is he... in that one. And everybody's in the tube together there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Paul, Paul and Charles are both in, uh, in the Lumber Baron as well. Lumber Baron too, sure. Uh, so... Maybe we should talk a bit about how you scaled up. This was shot after. Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah. This okay. one took place after. Um, and so our cast is a mix. We have some of my favorite actors from uh, Minneapolis that were in it. And then we actually, so uh, we got Chris Kattan to be in it, who's the most well-known of the actors in the piece. Um, and then what I kind of, the, again, putting on the business business hat side of things we had another actress that i'd worked with before um and she ended up not being able to work on the piece so we were kind of scrambling last minute um and we we found our lead actress uh ava uh dominici um who is phenomenal she's from argentina she's now in la and it was kind of one of those things where we were kind of casting last minute we're going through people and she had come off a couple films there in latin america and uh she just had a really great look and feel and i had a skype call with her you know, and I think it was like 48 hours before we shot, we landed her. And then we had picked up a couple other actors along the way. Um, uh, our lead actor um, in the piece, uh, Rafael, he's Polish, but he was at the time, we, it hadn't come out yet, but he had just finished shooting Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then um, again, kind of actors know people. And we got another guy that was our, our, our lead uh, Russian guard. And he was just coming off of uh, Stranger Things season three. Um, so <laughs> just they kind of, a lot of Russians. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, another actor, uh, Michael Villar, who was from Minnesota, was out uh, out west. And uh, he had been doing a lot of interesting stuff. So we got him on board. And then during the shooting, um, they uh, or I think it was maybe right after uh, the short that he was in Skins uh, won the best uh, best Academy Award for short film. And wow. then they had a feature come out on it. So we had a, a lot of talented people that we kind of cobbled together. But what we wanted to do is have an international cast to give us a better chance to sell it internationally. We wanted to have a known name so that, you know, whether people like the known name or not, you know, if they see a picture of the person or their name, they can sell it and then kind of fill it in budget wise with people who are really good and can go toe to toe with them. And uh, that's kind of what we did. And you weren't afraid of having a comic actor do a drama piece because there's tons of evidence that that makes a lot of sense. Those that hang around with me too much, that there's not many of them because I talk too much about movies, <laughs> even in my spare time. But I will say, I like if you can do great comedy, you will be a phenomenal 
like dramatic actor and there's just like literally movie after movie so it's like when i will not take a dramatic actor and necessarily make them a comedic actor because that transition's really hard but almost universally if you can do comedy you can do serious and so i i always felt that chris Catan had a lot underneath that you know kind of if you poked you know you kind of wake something so Luckily, we convinced him to come on board, and he came on board. And uh, you know, again, it's a, a an atypical film for him, and he's kind of in his rebirth now, where he's getting some more projects. I think a lot of people they hit a zenith, they kind of go away for a while, and then all of a sudden they come back with a vengeance. So I think he's on that, that cusp, that nice. cusp of that. Uh, I see you went with uh, doing accents on it. Any yeah, this is that? and I and I and I will I'll be the first to admit that it's a mistake. I should not have I should not have done that. We we went back and forth with do we just have a bunch of you know everybody just in their native whatever and i think the the uh, did you ever see the hbo chernobyl yes. uh miniseries uh a phenomenally well done but b they just never address it it's in yeah it's in the soviet union and you sound british you sound somewhere yeah, you know, <laughs> in the eastern bloc then that's good enough for me and i think that's what i should have done um but i thought we'd get too much flack if everybody just sounded like you're Polish and you're Argentinian and you're American. And you know, I thought it would, I thought we needed something to tie it together. Um, but I think for a lot of people, when you, when you work with people who English is their second language, it's hard enough to get nuance oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that sometimes I think you just make actors work too hard to get where you need to. So that's the uh, learning experiences. Uh, yeah. Well, I won't do that again. That's a good one. Well, I, I see that with uh, Guillermo del Toro's movies where I think he, he casts people, who are native speakers and then he, the way his his ear hears that dialogue it sounds right and that sometimes it doesn't did charles ever tell you his ben sir ben kingsley story about the accents on the show that he I don't on? no i don't i don't think i don't think oh, it's pretty that. fascinating um I, I won't be able to do it justice so i'll probably have him repeat it when i have him on in a future episode here but um they were doing the um, World War II movie, Everybody's German, yeah. and uh, they had uh, a lot of British guys. He was um, on it as well. And Sir Ben comes in after a few days of them shooting, and he says, uh, well, are we, are we doing accents or not? And uh, there was that moment where everybody had said, well, no, we're, it sounds like we're, 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 uh, we haven't decided. Are we, are we doing it or not? And so uh, he needs to tell that story because uh, – the the essence of Sir Ben okay. was so so good that he was able to just very quick. What is the lingua franca of this film? What, what will we be doing? And he was he would have been able to do either uh, on a turn on a dime if necessary. Yeah, well, to do it. he's 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 a legend for a reason. He's a phenomenal actor. So well, and like Michael Caine, willing to take low budget stuff, offbeat yeah. stuff. I don't know what the thinking is, but I'm glad that there are people who do that because yes. you get obviously great quality in it could be a movie like yours yeah so um lots so of yes people, i will call ben kingsley on my next Ben's film next. and then tell him that uh, might, eagle sent me you might be able to afford it um <laughs> working with people of a lot of diverse backgrounds in that in that room uh what was that like i mean everybody kind of came from a very different school of acting charles and paul from the you know the blood and guts local independent yep. scene Argentina, Poland. The yeah, it was it was weird. We got so sometimes uh, there's a lot of filming that it en ends up kind of just you, you, it. There's a certain amount of it that's just dumb luck. So Raphael and Ava had a palpable like it factor and a relationship that just worked, and that could have that could have been a torpedo right away. Even though they're good actors, if they don't have chemistry, it doesn't work. So what percentage of the movie is them? Uh, a good percentage of it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're like kind it. of yeah. leads. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the, in, at some point, if you're not hoping and rooting and feeling them being pulled apart, then, you know, you could care less about the movie in general. So that was a huge, you can't, if you don't, usually at, a, at, a, at an independent level, when you get actors of a certain level, you don't get to cast, you don't get to have chemistry tests. You're, you're kind of like, well, Here's the money payer play, and they say yes, and now you just hope that you know what's in your head translates. So we got lucky with those two. Um, uh, uh, our our actor that played the the captain, um, you know, he just looked the part. You know, you just put yeah. him in there, and just immediately towers over everybody. 
and then our hodgepodge group of uh, patients, you know, part of it was our production designer, uh, Chris, the, the thought was, is we just kind of almost wanted to make them go insane in filming, you know, just make it uncomfortable so that there's a reality <laughs> to what's happening. Yeah. Which, you know, I think sometimes sounds great, but uh, there's some stories. I'm sure if you talk to any of the people that were in there, uh, there was some, <laughs> there was some, some weird stuff happening that uh, I think that they were not having as much fun in that tank that uh, we might have otherwise thought that they could have. Yeah. I don't think 30 years from now they're getting back together for reunions <laughs> to remember <laughs> that great time of working on the set of Soviet Soup Experiment. The DVD commentary. Yeah. Uh, day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you if you give them, give them all a truth pill, you'd really get some good stories. <laughs> I think they've been through enough experiments there, Barry. That's fine. <laughs> so, uh, wh- how long was that shoot? All sets. Um, we did. Uh, I think we were. I think it came out. We broke it up into two parts. We shot everything. We closed down for Christmas, and then we came back for like ten days uh, after the kind of the holidays um, that year. Um, I want to say it was around thirty days, twenty nine, twenty eight, something like that. Sure. So within a couple of days of thirty days, was uh, I, I, I did, go, go ahead. ahead. Was it difficult um, shooting in that um, yes. containment unit? I mean, that's got to be. I mean, it, the biggest problems we had is number one, we we found a warehouse down in Lakeville, and even though that had heat and stuff, when you get dainty actors and actresses that have no body fat, they're just cold all the time. So it's just like no matter what you do, you can't ever make them warm. So, I mean, like, you'd yell cut, and people would rush in with basically parkas like you'd have in the North Pole. Yeah. And, like, you'd have – and if you shot too long, you know, they would, like, start shivering. So there was there was some uncomfortability in terms of – it wasn't – I mean, it was by no means, like, an unpleasant shooting experience, but it was just not comfortable. And I think had it been comfortable for them, everyone else would have been dying of heat stroke. Sure. Um, but I think it was just more – you know, it was nice that we were in one location – but it's not a luxury location. You know, we got couches and stuff out in the entryway. So it just it felt like a bunch of vagabonds broke into this place, built a set, and we just made a movie, and then we just left stuff there. So, it was, yeah, it was weird. Well, let's talk about the practicality of that. So you guys rented a warehouse. Did you have hotel rooms for everybody, and everybody stayed down the, in the duration? Well, we, had an, we had an Airbnb for a bunch of the actors, um, and then we had a couple of hotel rooms for a few others. And then uh, I think that was all we had to do. So it was mostly an Airbnb in a couple hotel rooms. And Chris was in and out a little bit, but was there for most of it, yeah? Uh, he was there. He was there, the, I think, the least of everybody. But I want to say that he was there. He was maybe there a week and a half. So, I mean, it was a, a portion of it, but definitely not as bonding as everybody else because, you know, he he's Chris Kattan. You got, yeah, you got, do that. You know, you, when we reach a certain level, you know. <laughs> you don't have to sit on the couch in the hall. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> For those who did, though, uh, so that sounds pretty cool. Were there? Um, is, has that one come out? Is that a, a no? So there, we're starting to shop it now. So we got the f- uh, official trailer done. Um, and we kind of were ready to roll everything out, and then the world shut down. And we figured that what was going to happen is, as people burn through the content, people are going to start buying. But we didn't want to be the first people on the table when everyone's like, "Yeah, we're not looking at this because we don't know when we're going to make money again." We got to we got to time it right so that they're hungry for new content, but not paranoid to spend money yet and you want to get a theatrical um spot i don't on a small I don't, scale again i would be surprised if this goes theatrical i think it's going to be a straight streaming buy a streamer uh, sure. for someone is my guess okay so why wait uh well because i was i mean that was my idea that if i went too early that then everybody would be too like you gotta it's like when the trauma is happening if you're right in the midst of it you're not you know you're you gotta not, wait for the hunger you gotta wait, yeah. You gotta wait till people are like, okay, I've I've gone through all my emails, I've done everything, and now I really want to work again. And I feel like we're almost there for these people who need to fill the pipeline of, as we've been consuming streaming left and right. Um, we're now ready to start shopping it. Sounds good. Are you able? Or is it all right if we show that uh, current and new trailer that you have? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Let's do that right now. Just try to tell me what you see. Madness. This is ridiculous! I have done everything and you barely feed me! This is all madness. You're a madman. 
They have been acclimated to the new environment for four hours. Now it's time to introduce the gas into the chamber. Subjects will be deprived of sleep for 30 consecutive days. This experiment is designed to test the limits of mental endurance and push the boundaries of human evolution. Better safe. Than sorry. Things are deteriorating quickly and everything has become seemingly impossible. Ask yourself this question. Do you trust Igor? No. I'm not a lab rat! This is science. This is madness. What are you doing? to go to the heavens with me? I, I think you're going to be able to sell that one, Barry. That looks pretty great. <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope so. The, we, we used a lot of the ideas of trying to give us as many kind of tools in the toolbox to be able to sell it. So we'll, I'm sure we've made mistakes and we'll, we'll learn from them, but hopefully, uh, hopefully it'll go well. I've got some questions from Zach Porter online. What was the process of adapting this uh, story? Do you know anything about the script? And because there's been a number of uh, yeah, different takes there, on this concept. So it depending if you're so we're it's going to be interesting. It's so the original part of the reason we picked this story is it's got a huge following online. Um, but I feel like I'm not the right person to give them the most gory version of this film. So I found a, a take on it that I thought would be of interest. It's either going to be really great because it's going to be palpable for people who kind of like thrillers but aren't into the hardcore gore. And hopefully there's enough there for people who are into gore that they'll sit through it and go, all right, we, we're okay with this. Satisfied. Um, yeah. Or neither party will be happy and no one will want the movie. And I'll just realize that you can't, you can't find the, the happy medium. Um, but it was, it, it was finding something for me that I could sell to actors because we had a, two different versions of the script going and I was putting it out to some of the actors that I had access to that had some name quality and just kind of the gory stuff. They're not, you know, there's not much to play there. They're just like the characters and whatever. So we, we found a more nuanced one, but it's definitely, if you're into the original hardcore gory side of it, <laughs> you might want to lower your expectations. There's not quite as much gore as there could have been. It's more, uh about the human collateral it looks like correct i mean there's there's both there's some in there but it's not it's not two hours of ripping people apart is that why you went with chris as your uh, production designer the well i i approached chris when i knew i wanted to do this uh for the makeup and then he pitched me on the idea of being the production designer and kind of talked through uh if you've ever been to chris's house yeah. he has an amazing aesthetic uh which is kind of just right up this time period anyway so there was a lot of it that worked but kind of you know, kind of the world he wanted to create on the budget we had, uh, it worked really well. I think that's a match made in heaven. How many uh, sets are involved? It seems... It depends it on if you're asking big. Chris or if you ask uh, our DP. Our DP says we have three rooms. Chris thinks that we have, I think he said like eight or ten. So oh, yeah. a, a, lot, a lot of the space is done where you kind of flow from one space to the next. So from a DP's sta standpoint, it was harder for him to create different complete looks because they kind of bled from one to the other but in terms of the art direction and what you had to make there was you know the main control room the tank kind of the entrance area of the tank you know kind of where they did the the surgery and kind of the testing then you have the one bedroom then you have the multiple hallways then you have the kitchen area so there's there's quite a few spaces but they're all contained in the one warehouse yeah it looks cool as hell what's the square footage on that warehouse to be able to do all that Oh, it was, I mean, it was much bigger than what we used. Uh, I couldn't afford to rent it all. Um, I think the building itself was like 25 or 40,000 square feet. And I think we probably, we probably had about 10,000, maybe 15,000 square feet of it. 
Did you like having it self-contained as a from a director standpoint? I mean, it's nice because it's kind of like you kind of know and you can kind of walk away, but there is a certain amount of you kind of feel like you run out of creativity after a while. You're kind of like, oh, my God, this is like the 27th day of Back filming in, in this room. Yeah. And, you know, you keep coming up with like, how can we shoot it differently? And you're like, ah, it kind of looks the same. Um, so it's 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 a blessing and a curse. But I feel like that's filmmaking is just constantly compromising and destroying your vision, hoping that the vision is good enough when it's over that other people think that you're brilliant. That's usually how it goes, especially in indie filmmaking. Yeah, I don't think I don't think people feel the repetition. They'll feel it as claustrophobia. Did yeah. you do anything to open it up? Did you do any exteriors or? Uh, well, we did at the very end. We have a, an end sequence where we went outside uh, and we had one flashback we decided to shoot. But otherwise, the whole idea was is that we didn't want to ever leave this space uh, so that it felt like the audience kind of started to go a little bit stir crazy like the actors, like the characters in the movie were. Yeah, great. Boy, what else? That's, it looks sharp as hell, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. So uh, were all the sets up all at once so you were ready to go yep. and just turn turnkey and off you went? Correct. Correct. How long Correct. did it take to get that to happen? I think it was like a month and a half, two months of okay. you know, from the time we got the keys and started putting up the walls and starting getting the painting to dry and starting to kind of move the set pieces in. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, did uh, Chris go as far as designing the sets as well as the decoration? or? Yeah. So he picked yeah, nice. the paint colors, kind of was in charge of finding the, the set pieces and the art direction and kind of how the whole thing went together. So, yeah, that's all that's all with him and his team. Fantastic. Uh, anything to say about stunts on that one? Looks like there's some people um, possibly one, getting themselves hurt. Yeah, we got a stunt coordinator in and kind of did it right so that we had some decent fight choreography that, I, A, didn't break our fragile set, and B, looked like when people got hit, it wasn't like, oh, that was a sad little fight. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we did a little bit there. Um, but again, a lot of, the, a lot of it's more psychological and you see the results, but you're not seeing a, you know, a pound for pound boxing match. Right. What else? Um, what's, what's next for you? This pilot thing. Yeah. The pilot thing, which is going to take place in Iowa. And it's about a woman who kind of is in a man's world with the artificial insemination of livestock. She kind of gets dragged back home and kind of doesn't want to be there, but doesn't know where to go next. So it's going to be kind of a, a mixing of worlds, um, which should be kind of fun to do. Uh, more exteriors, but around animals, which is always fun. Um, so that's the that's the next big narrative project that's on my on my docket. And that's waiting for the world to get out <laughs> of its mul mulligan of 2020, Correct. as you said. Yes. Correct. Well, I'll open it up to questions. We'll see if any come in. But in the meantime... Let me ask you one. Uh, is there a genre of film that you want to do that you haven't done yet? Um, the, I mean, I, I used to think I'd probably specialize in something, and I don't think I ever will. I think it's 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 if the story and I can work with the characters, I anything I can do with comedy. Uh, anybody will let me play with comedy? That's I, I love trying to make people laugh. Um, I may not be funny myself, but I think I know what funny is. <laughs> sure. Sure. But uh, so, yeah, anything comedy is good. Um, but otherwise, no, I think it's just finding interesting things that I think will engage people and can tell stories that I think uh, make people think. Cool. And to that end, who are some of your favorite um, people working right now that you look to for inspiration? Uh, well, I, I just usually remind myself that I have a long way to go. But Paul Thomas Anderson uh, is a master craftsman. Uh Christopher Nolan's a master craftsman. Um, trying to think of the people that like sure. I just have to see their work when it comes out. Um, that you know, I, a lot of people I like, but those are the two that I kind of look at and go, "Oofdas." <laughs> yeah, and they're they're, 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 they're chameleonic up. too. Correct. So I think yeah, yeah the fact that you're jumping um, genres already here on your couple of movies is uh, so it's a good sign that you're on the right on the right track. Yeah, there, I think so. Um, of the stuff that you made, Zach Karate weighing in, uh, what, what's your favorite so far? What's your, you think your best piece and oh, maybe best and favorite, maybe that might be two different things. Uh, I think they're different because it's the, uh, the problem is, is I don't know what other filmmakers are like, but I'm always disappointed in everything I make. Um, because I know I, I have the joke of, I have an idea and I get excited about it. Then you go to make it and not only do you destroy it, but it's like, it's not even what you thought. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> then you put it back together and yeah. you're like, well, it's not awful. And then you kind of get to the spot where you're like, well, actually, this is kind of interesting. But you never get to the point where you're like, well, that's better than my original vision. You're like, well, this is actually passable now. Totally, um, totally. And then usually by the time you're done with it, you've learned so much that it's hard to look at that piece and go. No. It's, it's like you're a different person. So it's not that it's bad. It's just like, oh, God, I would have done 90 percent of that different than I did this time. And so yeah. it, it's always hard for me to look back. I think you know, something like Relentless, that was a great piece because it was. I mean, I think we shot and did everything, including post-production for under 50 grand. Might have even been under 30 grand. Um, but it was like, you look at that and you're like, how the heck did you pull that off? And it was just one of those things where you willed something into existence. So I think from that standpoint, I love it. I think the Lumber Baron, we were able to basically... Uh, basically, we were able to take something that we didn't think was attainable and modify it a little bit from what the producer, writer kind of, you know, had in their mind and kind of find that collaboration where we, we both understood what we wanted, but we kind of got there by both, both of us being our best. Right. So the collaboration was there. And then the fact that it, what's fun about that is it's not necessarily a movie that I would want to rewatch. Like it's, I'm not my own audience for that, but watching that audience has been so like rabid. Like, like I've been in theaters that. that have been sold out, yeah. and they are just. I mean, it, it's like you delivered the joy of their world, and there's. And so, from that standpoint, you're like, man, if I can make people happy like that, I want to do absolutely more of this. So I wonder, is that like the people who loved like Merchant Ivory stuff, but nobody ever made it for Americans, and like a, a little bit I mean, <laughs> they're swooping in and hey, yeah, I've always wanted one for us, we, the Chippewa Falls people. I think I think what it is is it's 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 uh, I was wondering if when we were making the movie if it was uh, uh, if it was a movie without an audience because it's not really a kids movie, but it's not like it's not like all this high drama and like who's sleeping with who and who's like that you know it's not like a, a soap opery thing so I'm like yeah our our audi our adults gonna not like it our kids gonna be like well this is too you know whatever and what we found is that it's just approachable for everybody so if if you like it. It's just a fun world to kind of hang out with for an hour and a half, two hours. Wow. And so it, it reminds me of the old saying that nobody knows anything uh, that uh, what is it, Goldman said. And it really is true. I mean, you just you keep doing the work. And, you know, if you're if you do the work as best you can, you know, oftentimes it'll find an audience and it may be different than what you thought. And you're just happy with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't well, know if that but to, this question. And well you said it, you said it before. You, it's better to do it. Than to not do it because nobody Absolutely. will ever know if it's good or Correct. bad if you don't get it out. So good, keep doing that. Um, yes. Good. I know. I think that answered the question. Um, Zach says, Zach P. These two I can always count on. Do you always have to work through finding your own cast and crew for your projects, or do you rely on your network or clients to do so? And how do you approach others or market your project to appeal to others who might not be uh, not be sold on? It might be on the fence. Have you had uh, to sell people on? projects yeah yeah i mean i've when i've cast people before i've actually had to go meet them so they could approve me as the director oh, yeah. it's always an interesting place to be um i've had crew members that aren't sure if they want to work on a project that you got to kind of hard sell them on when i find most of my crew it's usually, usually people i've worked with or worked on other projects but then i always try to find new new people to kind of get on uh, production so that i can kind of test them out um, whether it is if they work for free or cheap on a feature or on another project and then kind of find who has that right energy. Cause it's, it's very important for me to have a kind of a positive attitude on set where people are just like, no matter what bombs get dropped in our lap, we're like, okay, we'll figure out a way to make around this as opposed to people who kind of get freaked out. Uh, Cause it's hard enough as it is, but having that extra pressure of trying to keep everyone else calm is really hard to do. You have a little bit of a repertory group that you keep pulling back. I suspect that that'll always stay the same. Is it the same on the other side of the camera? Yeah, I mean, I, I think both. I mean, you, you you always try to figure out who you can, you know, you know, Christopher Nolan works with all these people over and over and over again. And then all of a sudden, you know, for whatever reason, he starts working with new people. It's kind of that, you know, maybe people are in a different spot in their life. Maybe the a, a project calls for a different type of person. You like working with them to so give them a couple shots. So. I mean, I wish I could produce and direct more so that I could keep my favorite people working more often and I could work with more people on top of it, but it doesn't work that way. Do you think that Christopher Nolan rolls those dice because he can and that gets him back to that um, lack of surety 
that makes making stuff so interesting. Like, I don't know if this is going to work, and that's where the zone no. I want to be in. No, I don't think that's him. That's that I, guy. Everything I get, pick up about Nolan is he is very confident in his craft. I mean, we all have our doubts as 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 artists, so I'm sure he does as well. But I think mostly now he he trusts his gut and he tries things because he thinks they'll work, not because he. Yeah, I think I think Spielberg was more like that, where he maybe didn't want to work with the biggest actors because you know, then there can be an ego struggle between the two. Um, sure, but I, I don't I don't feel like with Nolan. I think Nolan I, a Nolan usually works with other British folks, and Brit- the British community okay. seems so tight that I don't think there's a lot of that drama that sometimes there is with American actors and directors. Mm, maybe uh, Aaron asks, um, "Are you involved in your editing, or at yes. what level?" Uh, I, I work in the last, so these last two films, I sat, my editor did a rough edit and then we went back and forth with some notes, but then I spent weeks, if not months sitting in the edit room with him where we would just basically throw things against the wall and be like, well, what do we, th-? you know, if something's not working, we're like, what do you think about this? And he'd spend an hour editing it and then we'd watch it and go, nope, that's not it. And then no, we'd be right. like, oh, well now how about we just <laughs> rearrange this here? And so it was basically like, we would just, you know. If I'd run into a brick wall, he's like, let me try something. And if he's like, I, I can't get this. And then the whole time I'd just be running in my head all these different scenarios. I'm like, oh, what about this? And so like I was I was a creative juice to kind of make sure that we didn't get stopped. But we were always re-editing a scene like nine ways to try to figure out a way. Can we make this better? Can we make it tighter? Can we you know, change the pacing in a way that works better? So, yeah, I've been highly involved, but I do not sit at the keyboard and do the edits. Sure. Did you uh, allow for a big piece of time for post then with that in mind yes yeah i've now realized that most i mean most of my magic happens in the edit room because we've failed so badly on set that <laughs> we we need the we need the lifeline in the edit room uh, pr- proportionally what do you think time is spent on post versus production i mean product if we say an average productions you know 30 days i would say post it's at least double if not you know i uh, yes thinking you're gonna say that yeah double or triple yeah uh how long, how long was pre-production on soviet shorter than it should have been um yeah you know we we basically we were kind of like trying to get stuff lined up so we had been working on it for quite a while but then it took a while to find the right spot to land and then our runway was really short and we had some problems with our cast dropping out and stuff like that so a lot of that pre-production time was just in panic mode like getting the pieces that we needed as opposed to making art um, so I think we had, I mean, we knew months in advance and we were kind of working on it, but I'd say that that month and a half, two months of real crunched pre-production was basically all we got. For sure. Uh, my buddy Jason, who's worked on a lot of our stuff, uh, asks, is there an actor that you really want to work with that might still be in, re- I'll, I'll add that might still be in your reach. In my reach. Um, well, you've told or me not. Ben Kingsley. Give me your, give me your so. favorite. Oh, Ben Kingsley. Sure. Let's put him on. We'll- Put them on the, 1A. <laughs> the, I mean, I love people like, uh, I'll, I'll just go to old, older actors. Um, uh, cause a lot of times they, they, they age out where they can't make a lot of money and sometimes you can pluck them. But, uh, um, oh my God, now I'm trying to, I can see his face. I can't think of his name. Um, what did he do? Uh, uh, do you ever see in the bedroom? No, sorry. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been in the bedroom, but I don't yeah, know. Not, and it sounds racy, but it's not a racy movie. Um, uh, give me one second. Uh, yeah, look it up. I gotta look it up because now it's bugging me. Uh, it's not. Yeah, he's so compelling. Saying. I can't remember his name. That's how I want to work with him. So well, uh, that means that he can transform himself to whatever role. That you Tom, Tom Wilkinson. Oh yeah, I love love Tom Wilkinson. Um, he's in the full but, month. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I to me, I I just I I have a weird love affair with actors because I think what they do is so bizarre. Oh yeah. That. Actors who oh, actually not an actor. This will be a surprise. Have you watched the new um, uh, Netflix series uh, uh, Lost in Space? Uh, no, but it was recommended to me as being pretty interesting. Uh, it is What's pretty your interesting. Take on it? But, there, but there's an actor in there um, that uh, uh, is phenomenal. His uh, Ignacio uh, Seraccio or something. I don't know how you yeah. pronounce his name. But we actually we he's he's booked. But we actually tried to get him for um, this pilot. But I listened to a podcast with him, and the way that he approaches acting, like in- instantly, I'm like, yes, we would be friends, I'm like in love with like this guy. work friends, because like just 
how how he views the partnership between him and a director, his responsibility as an actor, how he you know interacts with the crew. Like instantly, you're like that's the person I want on my set because you're talented, and also you are going to you're going to make the project better. Not be someone we have to dance around and like you know kind of kiss your butt. I have a long drive to work, and this last year I've been spending a lot of time listening to the various conversations, actor on actor and uh, actor roundtable things that uh, Hollywood Reporter and uh, Variety and uh, all sorts of other online magazines do. And it's just fascinating to hear them talk about the craft. And it's come back to me that acting is the greatest special effect. If you can get really good acting, it's yeah. you need it. Uh, yeah. And it's why I think live action filmmaking is so uh, so frustrating until you can reach that. And it feels like you've reached the scale where you're starting to see some of that. So good for you. Thanks. Um, were you involved at all in raising the money for your projects, or did that come with the with the producers? The Lumber Baron, I was not involved with any of the fundraising in that one. For Soviet Sleep Experiment, I was involved with raising the funds for that. Are you able to talk about the size of those two budgets? We talked about uh, the your low budget piece, but not the um, the. I the last think two. they published. I think they published uh, Lumber Baron. I think it was around like three hundred grand, something like that. Yeah. So it's 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 money. It's not nothing, uh, but for a period film at that scale, really yeah, it's definitely it's definitely really small. Um, yeah. And uh, Soviet Sleep, Sleep Experiment was it's listed as a million dollars, uh, but it was less than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> take you take that at, at uh, face value, sure. Not the sticker price, but uh, yeah, it's, it, that's definitely it's a bigger. suggested retail price. Yeah. <laughs> Not exactly. the manufacturing price. Oh, very good. Do you have any advice to people um, who want to f- uh, take this on as a as a career choice? I have two two consistent things I tell people. Number one, if there is another option for a job that you think that you want to do, stop doing this because this job is way too hard and way too unfulfilling if you don't love it. And then number two, stop talking about anything you're doing and make sure that you're doing something. Like, I don't care what it is. Like, make sure that you are absolutely going out there shooting, like, you know, especially now, by yourself, running tests in your house, coming up with things, writing, you know, breaking down scenes from other movies. Like, this idea that waiting around for something to happen or waiting for the perfect script or waiting for the perfect opportunity, you will miss out on everything if you do that. Just remember, James Cameron started on Piranha 2. <laughs> uh, directing <laughs> yes. on Piranha 2. Although, uh, boy, I dug into a couple of the Roger Corman pictures that he was involved in various scales with and uh, listening to the commentary and documentaries on those, how he was hired as a production designer and like co-directed yeah. scenes and like bitched at the real director and stuff. So, uh, yeah, he, he knew he was destined for <laughs> Great. Say, bigger things. Yeah, for sure. But he did take those steps. And I think sometimes people forget that you don't have to you don't have to come out of the gate with a masterpiece. You don't have to be Orson Welles. Well, and like you said, like your analogy with the Steadicam class, this is a guy who did visual effects, miniatures, matte painting, and then took on shows in which he had to be able to talk to those people. Yes. So, yeah. It's very so important. All part of it. Yeah, this God. is a tough a tough field. You kind of have to know more than most arts to be able to um, have the role that, that you've taken. Um, and now you're directing some pretty awesome looking stuff there, Barry. We're very excited for you. Thank you, man. All right. Well, it was great talking to you. And um, and can I uh, say one thing before you yeah, go? Yeah, we should. Because you, should. You, you, you gave me a lot of love, but you, you, in fact, are kind of, in essence, a co-author of my book because you actually wrote the chapter on post-production. I don't know I if you tell people that, but I want like, to some, give you some props for that. For sure. Is it? Uh, did that stuff make it into the second edition, or is it? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think we it's should probably have done it. Probably should have done a polish on that, but yeah, thanks yeah, for, uh, so good. much for the opportunity because then uh, <laughs> as I uh, got a job at a like a real college where they care about that kind of stuff, it looked great on my good. CV, and uh, it, it proved to me that uh, you don't need to wait. Again, you don't need to wait for somebody to say, would you like to do something? So I wrote, I've written one on my yeah. own. It's fun, fun as hell. Awesome, man. And you only have yourself to blame when it's bad, which is Yes, nice. exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's the curse of our lives, yeah. That's a great takeaway. falls on you. Well, we'll be watching uh, what comes from you, Barry. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And my students, thank you as well. Yeah, tell them thanks for uh, spending some time with us. For sure. All right, and uh, we'll see you guys in shows to come. Uh, Probably again next week, uh, pull in some of our other pals who are deep in the weeds on this kind of filmmaking stuff. So we'll see you guys later.